Today I'd like to take a look at the uh, uh, subject of the Apostle Peter. Uh, Peter, according to the uh, Catholic Church, was the very first pope that uh, God appointed. Uh, Peter was one of the original uh, 12 disciples. Peter was uh, one of the disciples that uh, apparently spent a lot of his time in uh, Jerusalem. And it's uh, said, we can't find it in the scriptures, that uh, at the end of Peter's life he was uh, uh, crucified. And he chose not to be crucified as Jesus was, but it said that he was crucified upside down. So he would not be uh, portrayed as being crucified the same way that our Lord and Savior was. Our first reading we'll take today is in, Matthew, as in uh, Luke, the uh, fifth chapter, beginning in the first verse. In Luke, the fifth chapter, beginning in the first verse, it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word, he stood by the lake of Gesseret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. So we find here where Jesus was uh, making his journey throughout the land. He had this great multitude of people, which we can imagine as when Jesus was walking by a uh, big city, that there was a lot more people that were around him listening to him because they heard the things that he had done at previous places and they wanted to be able to hear the uh, words of the man himself. Uh, we're not sure exactly uh, how many people were following at this time. All that it says was there was a great multitude of people that basically pressed upon him, were coming closer to him as we know there were people that followed Jesus, that all they wanted to do was be able to touch him, because they felt if they could only touch him, that they would be healed of whatever problems they had. So uh, we can understand at this time that Jesus probably felt pretty closed in at this time. And uh, as it says, he stood by the lake of Gasseret and saw two ships. He saw two ships uh, right there, because typically in this land, uh, around these lakes, you were away from the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, you had some animals and things that you could hunt on the land, but the easiest way, the best way in order for them to be able to get reliable food was to be able to go and get fish, where you could drop huge nets into the water, be able to collect large amounts of fish and pull them all in at once and take care of them all at once instead of going and hunting a lot of different animals and trying to put them all together to be able to feed a lot of people. And uh, as Jesus was... Uh, coming by them, these two uh, boats were empty, and the fishermen were gone out washing their nets because they had to clean their nets, they had to prepare their nets. The, sometimes the uh, great amount of fish would uh, uh, be caught into an old net and would cause fibers of the net to break, causing holes so fish can be able to uh, escape out of the net and the fishermen would lose the fish. So the nets were one thing that they had to make sure they took special care of to make sure that they were in the, the right shape to be able to drop into the water and be able to keep all the fish that they originally catch. And the third verse, And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed to him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. So we see where Jesus had felt so closed in that he stepped into the ship. Uh, this ship was apparently uh, owned by Simon Peter. And uh, asked Simon if he would thrust out just a little from the land, just far enough so Jesus could get away from the people that were basically hounding him for his help, for the uh, teachings that he had, and the other things that they wanted from him. So we see that uh, Simon Peter had done this, gotten Jesus a little bit further from the land, and Jesus taught the people uh, from being in the ship. In the fourth verse, now when he had left speaking, said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let your nets out for a draught. And Simon answering unto him said, Master, we have toiled all night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let the net let down the net. So we see here, we can learn things from the scriptures on how they did things back in the first century. Uh, apparently at this time, the fishermen would go out at night, would leave their nets out, and would be fishing all night. Uh, most likely, uh, as we know, that fish tend to bite more in the early morning, and uh, that way they could bring the fish in so the fish could be prepared, uh, most likely eating for that day since they didn't have methods of keeping fish and uh, meat cold, so it would last longer. 
And uh, Simon said unto Jesus, We've had our nets down all night, and we haven't been able to catch anything. But Simon did, as Jesus said, went out into the, uh, further into the uh, lake and cast their nets down. And the sixth verse, And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their nets brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they would come out with and help them. And they would come and fill both ships, so they began to sink. So after this time that they had been fishing all night long and caught almost nothing, uh, Jesus told Simon Peter to go out and let his nets out to the water, so Simon Peter did that. And apparently just at this time there were so many fish that Simon Peter could not handle it. He couldn't... Uh, Make sure trying to get the uh, nets in with the fish in it without letting the fish to get away. There was enough fish in it that it caused the nets to come close to breaking. So Simon called the second ship that was there to come out to help him so that they could pull in this great multitude of fish. And as it says, there was enough fish in the ships that they both began to sink. The eighth verse, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, all that were with him, at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. So we see here this great multitude of fish that they picked up. Apparently, uh, they probably have never picked up this many fish before in this lake, in these boats. That was enough to cause them to sink. And it amazed the fishermen so much that they immediately felt they were not worthy to be around Jesus. And Jesus said unto Simon, which is Simon Peter, Fear not, for henceforth thou shalt catch men. We know when Jesus went through his journeys and he chose the Disciples that became the twelve apostles. He didn't choose men of great power. The one of them that had the greatest power would have been Paul, because Paul was of the uh, group of the Pharisees, the educated, the ones that knew most about the uh, laws of Moses and uh, was able to read the uh, Old Testament that they had at that time. And it was uh, the people relied on the Pharisees to let them know what the Word of God said, because the people at this time, it had been long enough since they had written the Old Testament that they were losing their ability to be able to understand what was said. So it was in the uh, uh, temples that they could hear the uh, Pharisees and they could hear the other leaders in the Jewish religion let them know exactly what the Word of God says. Our next reading, I'd like to take a look at Matthew, the 16th chapter. In the book of Matthew... The 16th chapter, begin reading verse 13, where it says, And Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? So we see at this time that Jesus was trying to make sure that he was clear in front of the disciples. He was asking them, Who do people say that I am? And they said, John the Baptist, which John the Baptist was a relative of Jesus. He was the one that came before Jesus to help introduce the world to the ways that Jesus would teach. And then some said Elias or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. They were expecting that Jesus was one of the prophets or the people in the Old Testament that had come forward to today's time to be able to teach them. And Jesus asked them, But whom do ye say that I am? And the 16th verse, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, thou art the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock 
I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose in earth shall be loosed in heaven. We can see at this time that Simon Peter was a very bold man when he was around people that supported his uh, overall belief and supported the uh, teachings that Jesus was giving them. Because he was around Jesus and he was around the uh, uh, other 11 disciples. And Jesus asked, but who do ye say that I am? And Simon was the bold one. He was the one that popped up and said, Thou art the Jesus, the uh, Son of the living God. And Jesus said, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is the point when the uh, Catholics say that uh, Peter was made the first pope. And if we take a look, the, uh, in the original text, Peter is known as Petra, or a stone. It's the feminine version of the word stone. And on this rock, where it says here that Jesus was talking, on this rock is Petros, which is the male version of stone. So if we take a look at it, if Petra, or Peter, is the female version of stone, it's most likely a, a lot smaller stone. Whereas a Petros, as it says, on this rock I will build my church, is a much larger stone, it's a boulder. So I ask you, if you're going to build a building, what would you rather build it on? Would you rather build it on a stone that you could pick up in your hand and try and put uh, wood or uh, other stones on top of it to build a solid structure? Will it stand? Up until the 1900s, we couldn't make it stand on a small rock. After the 1900s, when we were able to uh, increase our knowledge of cement, we build on small rocks all the time. We take a bunch of small rocks, we stick them together, and then we put this mortar, this molding in between them to help hold them together. Funny, that's the same thing they had with the disciples. Jesus didn't pick one disciple. Jesus picked 12 disciples. You had uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John and all the disciples put together so they could work together supporting each other, uh, helping each other out to spread this word that Jesus was having them to teach. That's very similar to what we use for cement. But at this time, you wouldn't be building a house on that. You would rather dig down and be able to build on the bedrock, be able to build on a big boulder that could support many elements of that house to the entire house to make it stronger. As the story says, there were two men that went out and built their houses, and one built their house on the sand, and the winds came and the waves came, and it knocked that house down. Whereas the wise man built his house on a solid rock. And the winds came and the waters came and it was not able to knock that house down because that house had a solid structure. So I ask you, what is the structure that Jesus is building his church upon? For it says, on this rock I will build my church. He's building it on the fact that he is the one true son of the living God. That is the boulder that the church of Christ is built onto. That Jesus is the rock that holds us steady. As uh, Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy, that there is one God and one mediator, the man Jesus Christ. That is the only way we can go unto God. We can't pray into Mary, we can't pray into Peter, we can't pray into Paul, we can't pray into any of those. Because there is one mediator, there is one person that was upon this earth and was raised from this earth to be with his Father. And that is the structure that we are to build our lives on, that he built his church on, and that is the only way that we have a chance to go into heaven. We take a look in the uh, 19th verse where it says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So what is a key? A key is a method to get past a barrier. If you take a look at a map, uh, can you tell just by looking at the map exactly what it means? A map's got a legend, a map's got a key, and it tells you for every little distance it means a lot larger distance. And you can use that little distance to estimate how many miles it is based upon the inches or millimeters that the key says that your distance is. 
it tells you which uh, objects mean certain things. It's the same way with a house. In order to get past the barrier, in order to get past the door, and to get into the house, we have to have a key. We have to have a method, which in this case, a key is an object that we can be able to stick into the locking mechanism to turn it to open the door. In the future, that's going to be different. It's already turning out to be different, where the method to get past the barrier isn't something solid. It's uh, simply a method, a thing that you have to do to either scan your fingerprint or scan your voice or something of that nature to be able to get you past the barrier. So what is the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Well, if uh, Peter was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, Peter's been gone for a really long time. And we have First and Second Peter that we can read from to get the ideas that Peter wanted to express to us at this time. But uh, the person that wrote the majority of the scriptures was Paul. Paul, in his great travels, writing his letters to all these different churches. So where in that do we find the key that's given to Peter? But I tell you, every one of us that has the Holy Bible has the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Because the key is the method to get past the barrier. And what tells us how to get past the barrier to get into heaven other than the scriptures of our Lord and Savior? He lived his life teaching us the examples that we need to follow to be able to get past that barrier. He taught us exactly what's going to happen. He taught us that this world is going to go away. It's going to go away in fire. And after this time, there will be the judgment. And he told us exactly what God is going to judge us for. God is going to judge us for, number one, everything that we judge other people with. I mean, if we're uh, white or black and we judge somebody for not being white or black, once we get to the judgment, we're going to be judged for that. But the one thing that we can't help that we will be judged by is by the scriptures. It's by the things that God has told us that we should do and the things that God has told us that we should not do. That is the keys to the kingdom of heaven to know exactly what we need to do and what we need to avoid to be able to get past the judgment and be found faithful unto God and to live with Him forever in heaven. That is exactly the keys that it's talking about. The next uh, scripture I'd like to take a look at is in uh, Matthew, the 14th chapter. In the book of Matthew, looking at the 14th chapter, beginning in the 25th verse, we find here another... Uh, element of uh, Peter's strength. In Matthew, the 14th chapter, in the 25th verse, it says, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is the Spirit, and cried out for fear. So we see at this time where the disciples were on this boat, and uh, it was apparently late. And they saw this image walking on the sea, and they thought, no man can walk on the sea. This has to be a spirit. This has to be something that's troubling. This has to be something that can hurt us. So they cried out for fear, as it says in the 26th verse. In the 27th, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. So Jesus is trying to comfort them, saying that it is him that is walking on this water uh, out to their boat. And Peter answered and said unto him, and said, Lord, if it be thou, bids me to come on the water. Can you see all the doubt that's in that statement? Lord, if it be thou. He's not even sure if it is the Lord. But Jesus said that it is him, be not afraid. So Peter's taking this chance. Jesus, if it's really you, bid me to come out and walk on this water. I mean, if Peter had the strength, great strength in following after Jesus, and he knew that it was Jesus, he wouldn't have had that doubt in it saying, Lord, if it be thou, if it's really you, will you do this for me? And if Peter had the great strength, Peter would still would be able to walk out into the water without Jesus bidding him to come into the water. And the 29th verse, and he said, come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. 
So we can see here that Jesus is not the only one at this time that was able to walk on water. Peter was able to walk on water, and apparently everybody that Jesus bid to come to walk on the water would be able to walk on water. That was just the great power that Jesus had. And we know that while Peter was in the ship, Peter was around the rest of the disciples. And Peter was able to build his strength up uh, from the energy of the rest of the disciples. And he was the one that spoke up in this group around all the rest of the disciples, saying, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come on the water to you. And Jesus said, come. And we can see what happens when he walks further in the water in uh, the 30th verse. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, and he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. What happened here? Peter was able to step out of the ship, was able to walk on the water. And as, as Peter was able to walk further to Jesus, he was getting further away from the boat. And he saw that the uh, wind was boisterous. He saw there was a lot of great wind. And he began to sink. Sink. Why did he sink? Because his faith was waning. He was getting further away from the disciples. He was getting further away from the group that believed the same thing that he believed. And he was still away from Jesus. He didn't have either of those to be able to pull enough strength to be able to have the faith to continue to walk on water. So what happened when he got to that point, when he got further away from both of them, he was sinking and he cried out, Lord, save me. And the 35th verse, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore dost thou doubt? Jesus immediately was far enough away from him where he could stretch forth his hand and catch Peter. If Jesus was close enough to be able to stretch out his hand and catch Peter, why wasn't Peter having enough strength from being that close to Jesus to continue walking on the water? He had let the idea of Jesus basically go towards the back of his mind, the idea of being around the rest of the disciples go back towards his mind, and what did he put in the front of it? The wind was very boisterous. The wind was very strong. And there was waves that caused him to start sinking. He was getting his mind further away from Jesus and more into the fact that he was on top of this water. People should not be able to walk on water. And there's this wind, and there's the water around me, and that's what causes him to sink. And Jesus stretched forth his hand, grabbed Peter, and said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Peter, where does your doubt come from? I mean, you're with the Son of God, you're around all these people that have been healed by Jesus simply by believing that they were around Jesus, they could be healed. If they simply touched the end of his garment, they would be healed. And he was close enough to touch Jesus and was sinking. Where did this doubt come to his mind? And this is where we find the characteristic of Peter. Peter is strong and very bold when he's around people that believe the same thing he believes. He builds his strength off those. But when he gets away from those, when he gets away from the people that believe that when he gets out on his own, he doesn't have the strength to be able to do the things that he did before when he was around the disciples. He automatically lost it as he got further away. Now, let's take a look and uh, compare Peter and Paul as they were freed from prison. Uh, we can see this, our first reading, we're going to take a look in Acts. Well, both these readings will take a look in Acts. The first one is going to be in the book of Acts in the 12th chapter and the 7th verse. And here as we find when Peter was being freed from jail. In Acts the 12th chapter and the 7th verse, and it says, And behold, the angel of the Lord came unto him and shined a light in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And wist not it was true, which was done by the angel, 
but through, though he saw a vision. So we find here where the angel had come in, come in, he had smote Peter on the side, he had raised Peter up. I'm not sure if this is because the angel bid Peter to raise up, or the angel had caused Peter to be raised from the way he was either sitting or laying in the prison, had caused Peter to be raised up, and he was able to get out of the prison. We can see the same type of story if we took a look in uh, Acts, the 16th chapter. In Acts, we'll look at chapter 16 and the 25th verse. In Acts chapter 16 and the 25th verse, uh, here we find where Paul was in prison. And it says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all of the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosened. There's a big difference in those two stories. I mean, we find where Peter was uh, in the prison and an angel came and smote Peter on the side and raised Peter up and brought Peter out of the prison. And what happened with Paul? It is Paul and Silas that were in prison together and they prayed to God and sang praises to God. And there was a great earthquake that happened from this. And they were loosened from the prison, and they were able to get up and walk out. And as you uh, continue on and read, we can see in the 27th verse, where it says, And the keeper of the prison was awaking from his sleep, and seeing that the doors were opened, and he draw his sword to uh, would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. And Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. That must have been an amazing time when uh, Paul and Silas were praying and were singing songs of praise to God, and there was a great earthquake, and all the doors were opened, and all the chains were loosened. We can see what would happen to this guard. As it says, the guard pulled his sword out would have killed himself. I mean, that's probably what would have happened to the guard if the uh, supervisors had found out that this guard had let all the doors open, all the chains go, and all the prisoners leave. But uh, Paul said and cried out in a loud voice, saying, Do no harm to yourself, for we are all here. Even though all the chains are off, even though all the doors are open from the earthquake, Paul and the other prisoners were still in their cells. I can imagine Paul had a... Uh, great reasoning for wanting to stay in the cells too. Because what happens when you're uh, ch chained up, when you're tied up around other people that do not know the gospel? It's a great time to be able to teach them the gospel. That's probably part of the reason why Paul was uh, praying to God and was singing songs of praise. And I'm sure he spent some time teaching those that were around him in the other cells. But we can see just looking at these two, that it took an angel to come and free Peter, whereas Paul and Silas were able to pray and to sing songs of praise to God, and they were freed from that point. It didn't take God sending anything down to them. They were freed simply from their faith that God would take care of them. Next, take a look in Matthew, the, uh, Matthew, the 26th chapter. In Matthew... The uh, 26th chapter, we find here where Jesus was taken and being tried. And the 31st verse, in Matthew, the 26th chapter, the 31st verse, and it says, And they said unto him, and then, then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me for this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. And after I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. So Jesus is telling them, this is when they were gathered together before he was taken uh, to be tried, that all of them, this night, this night that he is talking to them, will be offended by Jesus. They will be scattered. And Jesus is telling them exactly what's going to happen. He's telling them, but after he is risen, after I am risen again, 
I will go into Galilee. He's telling them that after he is crucified, after he is killed, at the point when he is raised again, he will be in Galilee to talk to them. And we find here where Peter was around the rest of the disciples. So how was Peter feeling? Peter was feeling very strong because he was around Jesus and the disciples. They were all there while Jesus was talking to him. And it says in the 33rd verse, And Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended because of thee. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt, be, thou shalt deny me thrice. Jesus is telling Peter, you're wrong. You're going to be offended from me, and before the, before the uh, cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And then Peter was very bold, because he was still around Jesus, and he was still around the disciples. And Peter said unto them, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise the others, all the disciples, said the same thing. Peter wanted to show his strength. He wanted to show his power to Jesus. And he said, Though I would be put to death with you, I will never deny you. And what power did Jesus have? Jesus had the power to know exactly what was going to happen. He already told every one of them that they will be offended, and they will be scattered because of what is going to happen to him. And he already told Peter that before the cock crows, three, uh, before the cock crows, three times will you deny me. Three times. And Peter was still around the disciples, still around Jesus, and he said, even though I will die with thee, I would not do that. And we find at this time, this is when Jesus was taken to uh, be tried. And we'll go down to the uh, 57th verse. And begin reading the uh, 57th verse of Matthew 26. And it says, And they that had hold of Jesus led him away to Cephas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace, and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. After Jesus was taken by the guards and was taken to be tried, the disciples all scattered. But Peter was curious. Peter wanted to see what was going to happen. Now what did Peter say? Even though I be put to death with you, I will not deny you. I will not be offended because of you. Well, apparently this time Peter was very uh, fearful for his life. Because even though Peter was very curious to see what they were doing to Jesus, how did Peter follow them? And it said, but Peter followed him afar off. He followed far enough he could be able to tell where Jesus and the uh, soldiers were going to. But he followed far enough away where he felt he was safe from being attacked by the soldiers and those that were around him. And when Peter came into the... Uh, palace to be able to sit and see what was going to happen to Jesus? Did Peter sit up by Jesus? No. Did Peter sit up with the people that were trying him? No. Where did Peter sit? In the 58th verse at the end of it, and he sat with the servants to see the end. In this time and place, where would the servants sit? The people that had the power, the people that had the nobility, would all be close enough to be able to see what was going on and possibly be able to touch those that were being tried and those that were trying them. The servants sat far enough away where they could tell what was going on, but it's probably like going to a big uh, stadium. And you can sit in the seats that are far back, and you can see what's going on in the field, but you're in the same stadium. You're able to see what's going on there in real life but you're far enough away that people look really small and it's hard to tell what's going on with them. Especially if you have an obscured seat and your seat's behind a pole. And you have to look around the pole to be able to see exactly what's going on on the field. This is the type of place where Peter was sitting. He was sitting far enough away where he felt he was safe that anyone would attack him, that he could be able to run away or do something. But he wanted to see what was going to happen to Jesus. And we see that although Peter followed, he followed very far off. Continuing on in Matthew, the 26th chapter, 
uh, in, the tw in the 67th verse. In Matthew, the 26th chapter, in the 67th verse. This was the time after uh, they had finished trying, and the 67th verse. And they did spit in his face, and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, and saying, Prophecy unto him, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? And Peter sat without the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Also, was thou with Jesus of Galilee? So we find when they were uh, buffeting Jesus, when they were spitting on Jesus, when they were smoting him, when they were hitting him with the palms of their hands, Peter was moving out to, uh, towards the uh, outside of the palace, and a damsel came and asked him, wasn't thou one of those with Jesus of Galilee? In the 70th, 70th verse, But he denied them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him that uh, were there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied with an oath, saying, I do not know this man. So we see first that there was a, a lady that asked Peter, aren't you one of the ones that was with Jesus? And Peter said, no, he was not with Jesus. So a damsel came and asked him, aren't you one of the ones that was with Jesus? And not only did Peter deny that he was with Jesus, he took an oath saying that he was not with Jesus. He not only denied saying, no, I was not with this man, he took an oath saying that he was not with Jesus. Okay, so we got two times there. Let's take a look at the third time. The 73rd verse. And after a while came unto him they that stood and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Where was Jesus from? Jesus was... Uh, born in Bethlehem, and he'd uh, come out of uh, Nazareth. And he picked up the disciples while he was traveling around. Where did Simon Peter come from? Peter's, Simon Peter came from the area around Lake Gasseret, which was probably a good, uh, good journey from where Jerusalem was, and that is where Jesus is being tried. So they said in the 73rd verse, For thy speech betrayeth thee. The regional dialect that they had around Jerusalem was different from the regional dialect they had around the Lake Gasseret area. It's like uh, here. If you're in New Mexico or in Arizona, people sound a certain way. If you go to Texas and Louisiana, they sound different. You're from the same land. You're from an, a different area of it, and the regional dialects make you sound different. It was because of his speech that they knew he was not from Jerusalem. So obviously he was here to see Jesus. And the 74th verse, and, they be, and then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. So Peter, when they first asked him, if you were with this man, if you know this man, he said, I know not this man. The second time, uh, do you know this man? Were you with this man? He not only said, I do not know this man, he gave an oath saying he did not know Jesus. And the third time, your speech betrayeth thee. You're not from this area. You had to have come here following after Jesus. And Peter, as it says, well, apparently this is the way disciples and apostles are supposed to act and people of God are supposed to act. He not only denied that, it said he began to curse and swear saying he knows not the man that is being crucified. Most everyone that was in this area knew about Jesus. They knew about Jesus because Jesus was shaking up things. Jesus was able to heal people simply by talking to them. In this time before doctors were able to make people better, that had to be an amazing sight. I mean, people followed after Jesus simply because they were sick and they wanted to get close enough where they could be able to be healed by being from him. So, of course, all the people around there knew about Jesus. 
and Peter is swearing and he's cursing, saying he knows not this man that is causing this big uh, turnover, this big problem in this area, teaching this strange word and being able to heal these people simply by talking to them. And immediately, as soon as he said this, the cock crew. And what happened to Peter in the 75th verse? And Peter rem remembered the words of Jesus, which said unto him, For the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And what happened to Peter? It says, And he went out and wept bitterly, because he was ashamed for the things that he had done. He not only denied that he was with Jesus, he put an oath saying he was not with Jesus, and he cursed and sweared, saying he knows not that man. And that just cut him to the heart that he had denied. He had turned his back on the one that had given him so much, the one that had taught him so much, that he says he went out and whipped bitterly. That is the man that Simon Peter was. Simon Peter was very strong when he was around Jesus. When he was around those that believed the things that he believed, he was able to take their strength and be very bold. But when Jesus, when Jesus had gone off and Peter was away from him, Peter lost his strength. He was sinking in the water. He was not able to walk on water when he had got far away from the disciples and uh, wasn't close enough to Jesus. When Jesus was taken by the soldiers, he followed far enough away so he could see what was going on. But he wasn't afraid. He, he didn't have any fear that he would be taken by the soldiers or he would be hurt. That is the type of man that Simon Peter was. And we can learn from the mistakes that people do in the scriptures, the mistakes that it says that uh, people are doing wrong in the scriptures, and those are the things that we can take in our lives to be able to live, not only following after the keys of heaven, which that is what Jesus is teaching us, that is what Jesus spent his life showing us, but we can follow on the mistakes that the people in the Bible made and not make the same mistakes that they did. We can learn from the mistakes that they made in the scriptures and live better lives because of their mistakes. I thank you very much.